There's a small problem amongst historians of the Army's past and amongst self-styled military historians in general regarding, of all things, basic military concepts. These matters are the sort of stuff that is absorbed by soldiers during and prior to initial entry training, not the sort of thing anyone would ever learn at an institution of higher learning unless they were genuinely interested in the salient aspects of the military and the life it provides. This historian's lack of formal military institutional tradition calls into question the many comparisons they make between old army traditions and modern army traditions. I'm an old soldier with no formal training in historiography, and I, as implied earlier, often find myself disagreeing with some of the conclusions reached by stylish military historians. Simply put, there are things that just don't change regarding army life. Many military traditions are deeply rooted in the practical-minded military considerations from an earlier epoch. This video is to the historians who've never lived the military life. Things can't get any more basic than this, or in the words of a wiser man than me, super jumbo Crayola style. Today we are explaining the clear distinction between strategy and tactics. Yes, this is another critical scrutinization of John Keegan and his unfortunately divisive choice of words. The passage that irritated me is part of Keegan's opening rant denying the value of comparing battles from different time periods. I've already done a video about this first Keegan confusion, and I suggest you start there. Link above. Before watching this video, as this video responds to another Keegan confusion baked into his thesis. As should be obvious, I'm more than a little irritated by the fact that a professor at a military service academy could be so willfully naive about the chosen profession of his students. Well, come to think of it, <clears throat> this particular key in confusion has even seeped into some fairly recent military conflict theory. However, the aim of this series is not to discuss inter-service rivalries. It is to discuss why civilian military historians at times seem so out of touch with their chosen subject matter. Here's the passage. No doubt, however, the historian will, as I have done frequently, adopt a general staff approach and make use of its material but he will do so with the mental reservation that once off the nursery slopes, he will introduce his pupils to the real thing, the hard stuff. Let them get hold of the distinction between strategy and tactics, a distinction as elusive as it is artificial. This is the sort of convoluted thinking that passes as rational in academic circles. Convolutions and blending of lines might be fine when discussing semantics and theory. However, in the vital world of combat soldiering, the line must be clear, plain, and understood. If not for the soldiers, then certainly for the global public at large. How can a chain of commands, rules of engagement, or even the law of land warfare make sense to anybody if there is no distinction between strategy and tactics? My own take is that His Eminence Sir John Keegan, and by extension every civilian milita military historian since, is completely incapable of visualizing the middle of the military organization. It, after all, represents something they, by their choice to remain civilians, secretly abhor. The military was a black box to Keegan. When he looked down on it, all he saw were pretty brass stars and pips and batons and crowns twinkling on the top. Keegan, much intrigued, picked up the black box and chanced to glance at the bottom. All he saw was a single, poorly sewn, dirty chevron dangling off. The full weight of the box had obviously been atop the simple cloth rank. Keegan shook the box, and surprisingly it rattled. Well, must be broken, he concludes, quietly setting the box back down, returning to his comfortable office chair. It is simply inexcusable for an eminent civilian military historian to be so ill-informed about the structure, means, and purpose of the military. But sadly, this state of affairs, as suggested by John Keegan himself, seems to be the status quo. In short, civilian military historians have a higher purpose outside of and unrelated to the military. What is irritating to me, no more than a common grunt, about this state of relations between active duty soldiers and military historians is the fact that the line between strategy and tactics can, to paraphrase my grizzled drill sergeant, be made with a paint roller. Jumbo crayons don't draw a big enough line. The distinction itself hardly seems worth a video, yet here we are. So let me just go ahead and say it. Tactics are actions, techniques, and procedures. Strategies are thoughts, reasons, and judgments. Tactics are something you do. 
Strategies are the resulting and hopefully reverberating effects of what you just did. Flesh and blood soldiers are not unthinking static chess pieces, even if they are just represented in a cartographic shorthand on maps or sand tables or in narratives. Let's look at an example drawn from the book Infantry in Vietnam, Small Unit Actions in the Early Days, 1965 to 66. General Westmoreland himself provided a forward in 1982 to this book originally published in 1967. In this example, we witness a winning tactic that is simultaneously a losing strategy. I can't think of any other way to explain this other than with cartographic shorthand, and this graphic, which is my own, has been adopted from the book. If you look at this cartographic shorthand and compare it to the infantry field manual, you are apt to become confused. Is it an attempted envelopment or an attempted turning movement? The actual fight didn't play out quite like in the field manual. In truth and oddly, even the modern army small unit field manual does not make clear what the big army view is on small unit engagements such as this one. The reader must assume that such important decisions would be scrutinized by the army chain of command and indeed, history tells us General Westmoreland was preoccupied with bags upon bags of numbers. How those numbers were got, or let's say the strategy for achieving that stated, ob stated objective at the company level and below, was never closely examined by the general and his staff. Now you might be asking, how can we conclude this with just a simple cartographic shorthand? Didn't Sir John Keegan say cartographic, cartographic shorthand wasn't worth the paper it was printed on? Look carefully at the after action shorthand. You can see that the two platoons having found the enemy are unable to execute an orthodox tactical movement and therefore are unable to finish the mission. Captain Taylor is unable to fix the enemy in position with just two platoons. How does a general strategically preoccupied with meeting the enemy in the open allow his tactical companies to go out the wire minus half its strength? How does the tactical weight of a company light square up with the general's thoughts for overall victory? The truth is they don't. The rattling colonels, majors, and sergeant majors in the middle of the army organization, all but invisible to historians like Keegan, have detailed two of the company's platoons to other duties. Since infantry in Vietnam has General Westmoreland's blessing and appears to be offering advice to the small unit leader, I think it's safe to assume that the editor, the author of the narrative, and General Westmoreland himself viewed this action as a tactical victory. I, as a former infantry, must agree with that assessment. Forcing the enemy from the field of battle is, and always has been, a tactical victory. However, also, as a former infantryman, I see the seeds of General Westmoreland's strategic defeat. A tactical turn was the successful action on the battlefield that day. However, the uncritical strategy, find and eliminate the enemy on patrol, was, in my view, flawed. In my assessment, the strategy should have been more like what was used in Iraq and Afghanistan. Find the enemy and the enemy's supplies in their combat outposts and caches. Eliminate those combat outposts and reduce the caches, and then the enemy will be unable to patrol in the first place. Now why his eminence Sir John Keegan was so genuinely and stubbornly resistant to this basic paint roller kind of analysis as I have demonstrated here is odd and it casts a long shadow over his work. Keegan didn't talk about Vietnam in the face of battle because he knew his regressive ideas of military history would be shattered by the reality of the battles there. I am, like other soldiers of the line, deeply disappointed with Keegan and his magnum opus. I can look at the cartographic shorthand of battles and start to see how General Westmoreland lost the war in Vietnam. Of course, there's more to it than this single engagement, but none of it includes any civilian military historians' bizarre rationalizations about civil government leaders, politics, supposed misunderstandings, or Lord of the Rings notions of what a true battle really is. The more of it includes a higher logic of war. That's all we have time for today. This has been an independent production for YouTube by Goblin. February 2022. All rights reserved. I hope this was useful.